two things I think about Tim McGuire, uh, two specific incidents uh, that I remember. First, as a battalion commander leading about uh, 700 soldiers, he had to take over after the previous commander had been injured in combat. And his ability to come in and energize the unit that he took over, build a team very quickly, because it was under very complex conditions. And he was able to do that with an enthusiasm and with a, a, a base of standards that allowed that unit to continue to excel. And it takes a great leader to be able to do that. The second time is when he was a brigade commander leading almost 4,000 soldiers in the middle of Baghdad during very intense times. And his ability to lead young officers and soldiers and get them to understand the problem, lead by example, out front, teaching, training, and working in a complex situation, conducting counterinsurgency operations, and his ability to do that and relate to people and the people of Iraq and the soldiers that he commanded. And I'll never forget that and the quality leadership that he showed every single day. You know, Tim is an incredibly talented individual who was a great student and football player at De La Salle High School and later entered the United States Military Academy where he also uh, played football and was an incredible student. In fact, was honored as a National Football Hall of Fame uh, student athlete. Uh, but not only that, he succeeded in helping them win two bowl games, win two Commanders in Chiefs trophy. And Tim is the kind of person who then translated that into the Army. Uh, the Army is an incredibly complex place that requires great leaders. And I truly believe that leaders are built on the fields of friendly strife, and Tim proved that with his incredible capabilities. From the time, I think from what his basic roots back in high school, where he learned about serving and learned the importance of being part of a team, he continued to contribute to society in a very large way. I think that's what De La Salle High School football stands for, and he has continued to do that, whether he was a cadet at West Point or now as he serves our greater society. It's incredible the things he's accomplished uh, and the example that he sets every single day. His, his dedication to selfless service, his dedication to be part of something greater than himself, his dedication to continue to contribute in many, many different ways. That's what defines Tim McGuire. And that's what makes him, in my mind, such a deserving candidate for what he's receiving from his high school today, but also for what we owe him as a nation for what he's done. Taya is a very <clears throat> loyal, fun-loving person, but very competitive. So those people that know her know she does not like to lose. Um, but that's what makes her really fun to be around. She just makes stuff really fun and competitive. Um, but she's, uh, for me personally, we're, we're very good friends and she just is very loyal, very loyal friend. Probably what people don't know is that she was an amazing athlete. Uh, she was a player at BYU uh, for their women's volleyball team. And to this day, uh, after, I mean, I think it's been the better part of 20 years since she graduated. I don't want to nail down a number too much here, but uh, she still leads. Um, she's a, a top four in eight statistical categories on the all-time records list at BYU. And it's not all, you know, one skill either. It's digging, it's aces in serving, and it's hitting percentage. It's all over the board. She was amazing. In fact, she played in over 100 matches for either her junior or her senior national team back in Finland. And this is somebody that went to school in America and married a guy and stayed in America. It's not like she had a whole bunch of time to get that, that time with her national teams. She was doing that when she was a kid. So Taya is a real stud as an athlete. And so you don't always make the great transition to being a great coach when, when you're that talented. And I, I have a lot of arguments that I could present that Taya uh, really was an amazing coach. Her legacy is, uh, I think, what she brings through her children, she, her two boys. She's instilled in them, and as well as all the kids she's coached throughout high school and uh, competitive volleyball. She uh, brings, again, just a very strong-willed 
uh, fun-loving atmosphere to a competitive world. So uh, her kids are already there, and, uh, and it's just fun to watch her children growing up that way. And I'm sure they'll, they're, that's her legacy right there. To my knowledge, she was not only the first female head varsity coach that De La Salle ever had, I think she still is. And if, uh, if you look at the years that she was here, which is four of them, she wasn't a flash in the pan. She wasn't here and then gone after a good year. She was here for four years. She won the section title every year she was here after having never had the program won it before. There's an argument to be made that she's our most successful end of year head varsity coach here at De La Salle's history of sport. So the legacy that she leaves behind would have been impressive enough just being a woman coaching at an all boys school where the success is something you better have <laughs> or I, what were you thinking? And uh, what we ended up with was maybe our statistically, you know, speaking, our most successful coach we've ever had in the sport. That's the legacy she lived. But for those of you who don't know him, he's He's one of the most magnanimous people I know. He's very outgoing. He's, um, like I said, he's a fierce competitor. He's one of those people that you want to be around and you want him on your team. He was one of the first four-year starters with De La Salle Volleyball. He helped take it from a little unknown program to a program that was competing for NCS championships. And, you know, his, his even his bigger contribution to De La Salle was his ability to not only play the game at a very high level, but to teach the game at a very high level. He, as a player, acted as a coach um, quite impressively. He came back and um, helped mold so many teams along the way um, after he had finished playing both in college and professionally. He, he came back and, and helped guide this team and, and grow the program. Tommy cared more about De La Salle Volleyball uh, at the time we were here than I think any player ever has in its history. But the thing is, he still does. If, if he were here and able to, he would still be coaching here. It's, it's, it was his first passion, not only the sport of volleyball, but playing here for De La Salle and wearing you know, that jersey. So. Um, not only was he one of the you know first four-year varsity starters, but he's come back and contributed to the first NCS title as an assistant coach, and, and beyond that, he's um, helped me get my first NCS title as a coach as my assistant. And so he just continues to give of himself as a Spartan in the program, but also continues to grow the sport of volleyball. And so you know, his legacy is still still growing in the sport. Rashad Floyd is uh, one of the toughest competitors I've ever coached on a De La Salle football team. And also I remember about Rashad, it was it's one of the few two sport great athletes here at, at De La Salle High School. Rashad played wide receiver and uh, corner for us here on the football team, punt returner, kick returner, and he was also uh, the starting point guard for the basketball team. And they went to, uh, he was on the team that went on the first, that played in the first a state championship against Crenshaw. Uh, in the state championship game, I think Rashad ended up with 18 points, seven assists, seven steals against a team that was not only faster than our team, but pressing the entire game. So he had to control all the duties of a point guard. Rashad, in a lot of ways, was um, unfocused as a young athlete, and he was, we could see his potential. But basically, you know, he always had his, his own mind made up on how he wanted to do things. And he was at times frustrating to work with. Rashad at De La Salle was a, um, how do I put it, a real success story for us. Because Rashad came in as a freshman and he was one of those cocky, kind of know-it-all, uh, you-can't-teach-me-much type of kids. And... Uh, 
you know, we knew that as teachers and coaches, but... It was the summer of his senior year, and he had been playing a DB or corner in seven-on-seven -seven games, and he thought this was going to be a big year for him his senior year, and he was not doing well at DB, and a lot of times he wouldn't do the technique we'd asked him to do, but we knew he had the potential. We knew he'd be a great athlete. I just remember almost literally every day I was in math class hearing Rashad get yelled at, asked to leave the room, you know, Floyd this and Rashad that, and, and a bunch of other my buddies were in there, so, but he clearly was the ringleader. I think a lot of people misunderstood Rashad. He had a, a lot of spirit to him, but it was kind of like an unbridled spirit. And uh, a, lot of a lot of people may have called it a pain in the ass, but you know, he, was, he, he had a real soul to him. Everybody could, I mean, I think as adults, we all saw it and knew that this guy just had to grow up a little bit. And I remember he walked into my office up in the old athletic director's office in the locker room and he came up and he said, um, I know I'm not playing well. He goes, I want to be great. He goes, I'll listen to anything you guys have to say. He goes, but I really, I want to turn it around. And from that point on, he was just a fantastic athlete in the program. And so from his freshman to his senior year, I never saw more of a dramatic change in a, in a student and an athlete than Rashad. Well, I think the, the legacy of Rashad would be a legacy of a lot of athletes that came through here is that someone who got the most out of their potential and someone that really bought into the De La Salle community. I'm telling you, when he was first here, I think everybody wanted to kill Rashad. By the time he left De La Salle High School, he was a true redemption story because everyone loved Rashad. He was a great leader in the community. And this is, it's kind of like the reason why you teach and coach for guys like Rashad Floyd. You know, he understood what this school was about and his responsibility to moving it forward and paying it forward. And uh, that's a legacy that I think Rashad leaves for us. He was a, he was a real example for everybody. that stands out as the most noteworthy memory I have of Tom is the 1995 Foot Locker Western Regional Championship because Tom went from finishing ninth in the state championship the week before that to finishing fifth in the entire Western region the week that it was, uh, it was that it took place and it was at the same course Woodward Park as the state meet had been on and he just absolutely put together a brilliant race, came through, and in the home stretch, I remember, I still get goosebumps thinking about this, how uh, in the home stretch we saw the runners coming down and you'd see first place, second place, third place, and then you could see in the distance that Tom was coming in, charging home in fifth place, and sure enough, that was playing spot for the national championship. And uh, he came through and then finished in the top half of the national championship race the following weekend, so it was, uh, but seeing him come down that home stretch in the, in the Western Regional race was just something I'll never forget. During practice out there, constructing strategies for races, things like that, he was always someone who clearly had put some thought into what his strengths were, what his weaknesses were, how he should attack the race, how he should, what he should do to, to be his most successful in any given race. And uh, he was always very thoughtful, and there was a certain maturity about him that over the years of coaching high school athletes, I've rarely seen. Um, a lot of high school athletes are either too timid or too reckless in terms of their tactics, and Tom was always very mature and very thoughtful in how he approached races, and I think that was a real key to his success. Beyond that, he was also really a sort of a, he had a real quiet confidence to him, he knew what he was capable of, and that's how he achieved some of those really noteworthy results that he did. Beyond that, I think of him as a sort of a, a person with a streak of independence that maybe was kind of subtle, but it was always there. And the example I'd give is this. Uh, Tom used to come to practice almost every day in Argyle socks. And it's a great example of his individuality and his independence because it's, it's very different for people to come in Argyle socks, but it's kind of understated as well. It's not neon, it's not flash, but it's different. And it gives you an idea that he was his own person. He was able 
by his own individual results to give us a measure of notoriety that we didn't have a lot uh, before that. He was our first runner to compete in the Foot Locker National Champions, Championship, and that was, that was really significant. That is, at the time, was the only honest-to-goodness national championship in high school sports. And to this date, it's one of the very few honest-to-goodness national championships in high school sports. And so for Tom to make it to that level was a really big deal. Uh, and that kind of put us on the map maybe more than we'd ever been. The second achievement, I'd say, is that Tom was able to raise the game of those around him. Tom was always a runner who was happy to run on relays. And some of the relay records that we still have at the school to this day have Tom Prindeville's name on him because he was willing to uh, sort of share that glory and share his athletic ability and push the athletes on the team with him to perform at levels that maybe they didn't think they were capable of. Oh, I'd say the probably the most memorable moment was uh, semifinals NCS against uh, Akalani's dark uh, football team had just let out of practice and they, they let him in free to the game. So we had like 40 football players in uniform on the side going nuts. And uh, it was an interesting game. We were, we were playing a, uh, uh, a press style defense and, and they had scored three goals, all of which were kind of garbage goals. Um, Chad, by far, you know, was our, our leader in the cage and, and best goalie in the section throughout the year. But um, like I said, garbage goals, tip flips and, and things like that. And it was uh, the end of the third quarter and I think we were down by one. Um, and Chad just voiced his opinion in, in the team huddle and said, let me take it from here. They said we would practiced this, this new style of, of drop zoning defense. And he said, use me, use my talents, let, let, let me help us. And uh, so, so uh, Jimmy Karras, who was the assistant coach, and, and myself, we looked at each other and said, well, let's do it. And we ran the, the what we called a press to seven defense. And, and basically, it relied on them taking outside shots at will because we were giving it to them and letting Chad block everything. And that's what he did. And we also happened to have a you know a future All-American um, out in the field. And we gave him the shots likewise on the other end. And we ended up winning the, the game by one goal. And it, it, it was a nail biter the whole time. But uh, I'll never for, forget Jack, Chad kind of stepping up and, and just saying, let me be that guy right now. And, uh, and he held his own. And we went on to win the championship that year. Chad's a lot of different guys. I mean, he was, he was an exceptional student in the classroom. Um, not only was he probably the best goalie we had come through the school, but he was a four-sport athlete. He played, uh, he played soccer, played water polo, um, both first-team competitor there. He made finals in NCS in two swimming events. Um, and then while concurrently swimming, he would run out to the track meet and do a high bolt or a, a, a pole vault. Takes kind of a special temperament to be um, a goalie, and Chad was also a defensive man or a defensive back in soccer. Um, and a lot of those people don't do it for the pride and the glory because, you know, every once in a while you get a byline in the paper, but uh, you do it because there's something about you that says nothing's getting past me. And Chad was that kind of guy, and, and uh, he was very vocal. Um, he was a good commander of his, of his defense back there. Um, he was a leader at all times and like I said you've got to be a little bit different as a goalie and a little bit cocky too and he said bring it on and uh, and he never backed down from a challenge. He, I always measure goalies at, at this school relative to how they stacked up against Chad. Um, huge contribution for the water polo program. He, he, uh, he, he moved up as a sophomore and, and was you know the backup goalie and uh, but it was always working just like a starting goalie, wanted to be a part of it, wanted to, to get in at all times and, and take, take leadership on his back. Um, as far as, as another thing he did just for the water polo program, he, without patronizing guys, without um, you know, getting too angry at them, he let them know where they needed to be at all times. He was a, he was a good commander of all the guys and, and kind of like a coach out in the field. 
I've been fortunate enough to have an opportunity to work with Maurice over the last 15, 16 years through all levels of, of sport for him. And um, he's come back to train with me, and when he comes back, he'll always bring people with him, guys that are on his team, guys that he's played with in the past. And um, it's amazing, we come out, and the first thing he would say to me is, we're gonna show him how we do it. And he's talking about how we do it at Dale South. And um, we get out there and we start training, and uh, the only thing that he would ever talk about is stories about De La Salle. It was this one story after the next. Whoever he brought out, two things were going to be uh, sure to happen. One, they were going to get tired. And two, they were going to hear about De La Salle. I've been fortunate to get to know Maurice in a training environment. And the person that I know is one of the most dedicated committed, hardworking individuals that is going to have success in anything he does as a result of his work ethic. I think one of Maurice's greatest attributes is his ability and willingness to give back to others. And uh, while he was here as a player, he made people around him better. And um, he's back now as a coach doing the same thing. Uh, his, his ability to work with others and get them to understand how to achieve things at a high level and to do things that they weren't quite sure that they were capable of doing on their own is what makes him special. Maurice will always be remembered for the tough-nosed, hard-nosed running that he did at every level that he played at. His ability to run past somebody, his ability to stick his foot in the ground and make a guy miss, and it's in the next play, come back and run him over. Maurice's legacy here at De La Salle is his ability to take the values and traditions of this program and interject them at the highest level of sport with unbelievable success. He made people around him better, he made his teammates better, he made the programs better, and he did that with De La Salle's tradition and values in mind. thing with that team was the heart. When you have 19 guys playing for each other, a coaching staff, you couldn't, you couldn't, in their eyes, you couldn't fail. If you made an error or if you made a diving catch, you get the same response from them in the dugout, slap on the back, go get the next play, same thing, strikeout, base hit. Just a wonderful, wonderful team. And I recall um, batting fourth and um, looking down the dugout, I think our number seven batter was up, maybe one or two outs, and we had the number one, two, three hitter, batting helmets on, batting gloves on, made me sit back down. I mean, we didn't know how to get out. We didn't think we could get out, let alone lose a game, win a game. So for that that heart, and when you have a um, guy sitting next to you with the same kind of heart and a coaching staff, like I said, that wouldn't – they, they gave us their 110%. We gave them 120%, and we just – we fought as teammates, and that was the 97 team. We had a great – 85 team, early 90s teams, but as far as a winning season in, in 96, which was 24 and 3, we want to do better than that. We had a 12 and 2 BVL um, record. We wanted to be, we ended up being 15 and 1 our senior season and being 25 and 3. So we went in to that season um, concentrated, focused, and I think that's one contribution that you know we, we gave to the the Dale South family is that we started a winning streak in 96, carried through in 97. And the second one would just be, you know, the, we, we, we say that on the campus all the time, brotherhood. I think if you look at the, the, the group of men that were on that team, now fathers and firefighters and businessmen, and I think we have a pilot out there, we are all for each other. And I think, you know, that, that's, that set the bar there too with um, who we were to one another. There was no egos. Everyone checked it at the door, and we all played for each other. And we had a brotherhood that – I haven't, you know, seen any other the teams I've played with. It's just something that is is amazing. I mean, it gives you goosebumps talking about it. Those that were on the team would uh, characterize ourselves as um, a bunch of guys that wanted to win and wanted to have fun and wanted to do both of those things equally. 
at 110%. It was, uh, it was fun because you won, and winning was made it fun. And it was, those were uh, basically synonymous with our team. Um, so it was, it was just a great group of guys that wanted to win and wanted to have fun doing it. And both of those, both of those things, winning and having fun, were the priorities. It wasn't one over the other. And I think that's what um, allowed both of those aspects to be, um, both to be great. And Ray Hill goes down swinging. The De La Salle Spartans are the NCS 3A champions for 1997. And that's a year, a culmination of efforts by all those young men at De La Salle. Very, very excited, a lot of emotion, and, and just happy that they've repeated here. I don't think you can induct any team into the De La Salle Hall of Fame and not include the 92 football team. They were a key element in our program. And the reason being is I had coached here already and coached on, what was it, probably, what, 14, 13, 14 seasons here. And we kind of got into a, a, a we flatlined in a lot of ways. In the, in, maybe about three years prior to the 92 team. And the 92 team elevated our program in a really dramatic way. I mean, we made a huge jump with those guys. And what I meant, mean by that is they raised the bar another level for De La Salle football. I think a key element for that was uh, uh, bringing, in, bringing on Steve Le Lexcos as an assistant coach. For me, the whole year boiled down to trying to teach these boys what it meant to be adults, which in my book is to be accountable and truthful to yourself, deal in the real world. The, the love and the bonding on this team all comes from, in my opinion, that layering of, of the truth. The moment that I believed that I had an unusual or a powerful group on my hands and you know, I can't pick the game, I really can't, but I can tell you the situation. We were on about the five yard line going in and it was third down. And we ran a rushing play and scored. And we got a penalty. We're now on the 15, I believe it was, third down, and we stuck it in and scored. We got another penalty. We we're back on the 25, maybe the 30. And I remember seeing one of my linemen step out of the huddle and turn to the rest of the linemen and just demand that we're getting we will not be denied we're getting into that end zone and I could sense from the sidelines the absolute not belief but knowledge they knew no matter what happened they were getting into that end zone welcomed it they came off a loss in 91 in an NCS title game had a lot of juniors on that team and they made a decision that they were going to bring this program up to another level and they did it and when you look around the locker room during that loss, the people that were most destroyed were the juniors. You know, we were, we were wrecked. And we came out that next season and uh, we pulled tires and we worked harder than, than I think you can ever imagine. And it was because of the fuel that was, that was there from that moment. So taking to the best experience, it was Pittsburgh Coliseum, uh, senior year, all on the line you know, memories of that loss burning the, the kind of passion that we all felt as a group that we wanted to win. Mm -hmm. 